This next topic we're going to look at is really the big workhorse in microeconomics, right? This is um, the supply and demand. The old joke goes that um, this is the only thing that you'll remember from your microeconomics class 20 years down the road. Um, so we're going to introduce the, the model of supply and demand and talk about all the different ways that it can be useful. Um, it, it's based on this story that we've already been telling about consumers wanting to buy stuff and producers wanting to sell stuff. And really, that's not new to you, right? You've already got a whole lot of intuition about the way this model is going to operate. What we're going to do is we're just going to put together a framework that you may have not seen before. And that framework is going to allow us to do a little bit more complex thinking. But for the most part, this is going to be a topic that's all about common sense in a sense, right? It's just there's a very logical um, intuition that you're probably going to already bring to the table with this topic. Let's start by thinking about the demand side of the market. And this is probably what you have the most familiarity with, right? That you're, you're very familiar with being a consumer on that side of the market. So the demand side of the market represents people wanting to buy things. Normally we think about that as individuals from a household, but this could also be businesses wanting to buy stuff, or this could also want to be, or it could represent governments wanting to purchase things. But for the most part, it's natural to think about this as people as part of a household wanting to buy stuff. But again, this is micro, not macro. So that's going to be our, our focus. We've got this uh, definition of the word demand. So in this class, we're going to use the term demand very, very carefully. And I caution you that outside of this class, when you see the word demand, even in good sources like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or, or Bloomberg News, sometimes when they use the term demand, they use it a little bit loosely, right? But we're going to be very, very precise with our language here. And what demand represents is it's a relationship. Fundamentally, the term demand for us in this class, it's talking about a relationship. It's describing a relationship between two different variables, prices and quantity demanded, right? So demand is a relationship between these two things, raises the question, let's make sure we understand exactly what those variables represent. Price. To a buyer, the price represents the amount of money they have to give up when they buy something, right? That's pretty straightforward. You go in, you, you want to buy a sub, you're going to hand over some money in exchange for a sub. How much money do you hand over? We think about that as being the price you pay as a buyer on your side of the transaction. Step back for a second though and think about this, right? In the last few topics, weren't we talking about the, the cost of a good being the full value of what we had to give up? Isn't there also a time cost to a lot of things? There are, right? But for simplification purposes, when we're talking about the cost of a good here, we're, we're going to restrict um, our, our focus to just be focusing on the price. But prices, what do we measure them in, right? In the US, we measure them in dollars, right? But we're just measuring the amount of currency that has to be given up in a transaction. That's one of the variables. How much do buyers have to give up when they buy a product? The other variable that we're looking at is quantity demanded. So quantity demanded is quite literally a counting up. It's the number of units that consumers want to purchase, right? So for, again, if we're talking about subs, this is literally the number of subs that people want to purchase. Here we go. Graphically, we're going to present the, the same information on the left. This is going to be a pretty straightforward graph. And when you do graphs in this class, um, this is the way that you should structure them. Vertically, the thing that we're measuring, P, P for price, Q, Q for quantity, and specifically right now we're thinking about the quantity that consumers want to buy, the quantity demanded, right? So there's this guy named Alfred Marshall, this very famous economist from an, a number of years ago. He was the one who actually put price on the vertical axis, and ever since then, that's the way that we always do it, right? And so we're going we're gonna to continue with that notation, but in a little bit, I'm going to point out where that might be a little bit of a, of a, of a strange way to view the situation, right? But Vertically, we measure price. Price is the thing that we always put on our vertical axis. Quantity, that's what we measure horizontally. What do we put on our horizontal axis? We always put quantity, and it's measuring, again, the quantity, how much consumers want to purchase. Demand, then, the term demand represents the relationship between those two variables, and it's an inverse relationship. Remember, what does it mean if something has an inverse relationship? It means that those two variables move in opposite directions. Their change is going in the opposite direction. If one is increasing, the other is decreasing, or vice versa, right? How do I draw a line that shows an inverse relationship? It is, quite simply, a downward sloping line. So what I'm asserting here is that this 
line, this downward slo sloping demand, uh, downward sloping line that I just drew, that I'm labeling that with a D because that's what the demand represent represents. This line is the demand for a product. So the way to think about this is let's pick two different points on that line, right? Point A, point B. Let's do this one as A, this one as B. Point A has two different values of our variables that we care about, right? Vertically, what we're measuring with point A is the price of a good, and horizontally, what are we measuring horizontally? We're measuring the quantity demanded of good A. Remember, again, the price represents, this is the price that buyers would be paying when they go to purchase something, and QD, I'm using a D as a superscript there to represent quantity demanded, QDA represents, this is the amount that consumers would want to purchase at that price A. That's one point that's on this demand curve, right? The second point that's on this demand curve, point B, notice prices are lower. Prices are lower. Prices have gone down from point A, and when prices went down, what happened to the quantity demanded for uh, um, at point B? Quantity demanded went up. That's the inverse relationship that we're talking about. When prices went down, quantity demanded went up. That's the inverse relationship. Those two points are two points on the demand curve. So again, right, I'm making this really, really, I'm trying to make this really, really strong distinction between these three different ideas. Prices, those are the amount of money that consumers fork over when they buy a, 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 a product. Quantity demanded is literally a counting up. How many units would people want to purchase? And demand is the relationship between those two variables. When prices go up and things become more expensive, people substitute away and don't want to buy as much, right? There's this real good logic that you probably um, that you probably have built into the way that you purchase things. You walk into a store and you see that something is more expensive, you think twice about buying it, right? Or if you uh, go into a store and you see that something is on sale, that might be an incentive for you to want to buy it, right? Inverse relationship between the price and how many units you'd want to buy. Okay, so I've got this little line here and I want to explain what it represents, right? Individual demand is different from market demand. What I just said was you walk into a store or you uh, and you see the price of something. Ah, that's your individual demand. That's how you individually would respond to different prices. But remember, what we're looking at is we're not looking at your individual demand, but we're looking at market demand, right? This capital D, that represents the market demand for a product. Oftentimes, though, individually you can get a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of intuition about what's happening if you think about how you would individually respond to a situation and then just what the market represents is the aggregation of all the individuals so if we can add all those things together then then yes right we, we can we can use your individual intuition to think about how the overall market would work the way that this is different, right? So if we all walked into a, into a store and we all saw that the price of apples had been uh, marked down so that they were a lower price, some of us would want to buy more apples. Some of us would jump off the sidelines and start buying apples, right? Both of those factors would be in play, but we'd see an increase in the total amount that all of us want to buy. Quantity demanded is the total amount that all buyers want to purchase in the market. Right, and um, so normally this, this aggregation story works pretty well with us, but I wanna talk through a really quick thought experiment, right? So think about being to a grocery store. If you've been to Ada, you know that the community market's uh, uh, south of campus, it's, it's got a couple of different lines in that grocery store. Think about going to a store, it doesn't have to be community markets, it can be anyone, that has three different lines. And let's assume that one of those lines um, is open and the other two are closed right now. If we have 10 people in line in one of those, uh, one of those uh, grocery store lines, you got a lot of people waiting, right? What if that store saw all those people waiting and decided to open up a second lane? What if the grocery store decided to open up the second lane? Well, this individual here, individual one, right? Could they be better off by switching over to this next lane? Individual two, could they be better off by switching to the next lane? Could individual three? In essence, if everyone took a step to the right and jumped into that other lane, would everyone be better off, right? Ah, that's a story where individually what make what may make one of us individually better off will not hold 
for the entire group. We can't just aggregate all of those gains of being better off. Most of the time, we're, we're, we don't have an aggregation issue for the most part, so um, we're going to be okay with, with, with using just your basic intuition about how things work. Demand. Demand is based on this concept of willingness to pay. What is willingness to pay? Willingness to pay, we've got this little definition here. WTP is the, the acronym that we use for, for representing it most of the time, right? Willingness to pay is the maximum amount that a buyer is willing and able to pay for a good, right? So I want to posit a question to you. Um, what are you willing to pay for a cup of coffee in the morning? Right. This is this is one of my classic examples because I, I'm someone who loves coffee. Right. I, I, I drink a fair amount of coffee in the day. But think about for yourself, how much are you willing to pay for a cup of coffee? And then my follow up question to be to you is, is that really what you're willing to pay for a cup of coffee? Meaning that if whatever price you said, is it really the maximum amount that you'd be willing to pay? Right. Meaning, if the price that was advertised was one penny above what, whatever number you just said, would you walk away from that transaction or would you suck it up and still buy that cup of coffee? Really, willingness to pay is the maximum amount. It's that tipping point amount where, where you are willing to, to pay that price versus walking away from that transaction. Whatever that tipping point price is, that, that's your willingness to pay. Oops, there's a second part to this definition, right? It's the maximum amount that a bill, buyer is willing and able to pay for a good. You've got to have access to the resources, right? So you may have said, I'm willing to pay $10 million for a cup of coffee, and statistically, it's likely that no one in this class has access to $10 million that they could use to buy a cup of coffee. If you did, sure, great. But, but if you don't have access to that amount of money, then that can't be your willingness to pay. Your willingness to pay is constrained by the amount of money that you have. I think about this as do you actually have the money in your pocket, but really it's about access um, access to that, to being able to get those goods. So that it, it could allow for some debt financing of some stuff. Okay, so I just asked a question. What are you willing to pay for a cup of coffee? My follow-up question is, what are you willing to pay for a second cup of coffee in the day? How about, what are you willing to pay for a third cup of coffee? More than likely, your willingness to pay got lower, right? The value that you place on that first cup of coffee was probably the highest. How much are you willing to pay for a second or a third or a fourth or a fifth cup of coffee? Probably went down and maybe it even dropped down to zero, right? Willingness to pay? I didn't ask, what are you willing to pay for three cups of coffee? But I asked, what are you willing to pay for your third cup of coffee? That means that willingness to pay, the way that we measure this thing is as a marginal measure. And for nearly everything in life, we have what we call diminishing uh, willingness to pay. We have a decreasing willingness to pay. The more you have of something, the smaller value you place on additional units. So we can also think about this as um, pizza. That's another classic example because who doesn't like pizza, right? Everybody likes pizza, right? So if, if we're thinking about this, this graph of the willingness to pay for pizza, right? We could think about measuring willingness to pay on the vertical axis and real quick, what are the units that we use on willingness to pay? It's the maximum amount. So it's still a dollar value, right? It's the maximum amount. We're still measuring currency on our vertical axis. And horizontally, we're counting up. In this case, this would be a quantity of pizza. More than likely, your willingness to pay looks something like this, right? Where what are you willing to pay for your first piece of pizza? That's probably the val the highest willingness to pay for you have for your piece of pizza and for a second piece of pizza and a third piece of pizza and so on and so on and so on. And eventually this is going to get a very, very small number and even be zero, right? L let's put some hypothetical numbers on this willingness to pay for, for pizza. Let's say that you're willing to pay for that first piece of pizza $8. Maybe for you that's high, maybe for you that's low. Two, uh, your second piece of pizza maybe six dollars. Your third piece of pizza, oh, it drops by a lot, and so it drops all the way down to, let's go three. And then your fourth piece of pizza, you're only willing to pay a dollar, and that fifth piece, 50 cents, right? If these are what you're willing to pay for pizza, how does that relate back to the concept of demand? Here we go. If this, these different values represent what you're willing to pay for a piece of pizza, then I can ask the question, all right, so how much are you going to buy if the price of pizza is equal to, let's say, $4? If you walk in and a piece of pizza is priced at $4, 
where is four dollars on this it would fall somewhere around this right if this is a price of four dollars do you want to buy that first piece of pizza you do and i want to i want to lay this out a little bit long um the long form of this really but we can we can think about this as your your decision to buy that first piece of pizza are there some benefits are there some costs what's the benefit of your decision to buy that first piece of pizza your benefit is you get a piece of pizza what's the value you place on that first piece of pizza that's what your willingness to pay is right and in this case the value you place on that first piece of pizza, the value you place on that benefit is $8. What was the cost? What do you have to give up to get a piece of pizza? You give up the price. If the price in red is only $4, rationally, should you buy that piece of pizza? Great question, right? Rationally, should you buy this piece of pizza? In this class, whenever I ask you rationally, should you do something, there are two things you should tell me about the benefits and the cost. Remember, those are the foundations that we use in our definition of rationality in this class. You got to tell me when I ask, is this a rational decision for you to buy that first piece of pizza? You got to tell me something about benefits and something about costs. And what is the story? Yeah, totally. You want to buy that. Uh, you want to buy that first piece of pizza because the those benefits are greater than the cost for that first piece of pizza. How about the second piece of pizza? Is it rational to buy that second piece of pizza? Sure it is, right? Because the willingness to pay the value you place on the second piece of pizza is greater than the cost of four dollars buy that second piece of pizza how about that third piece of pizza no you're not willing to pay uh, you're only willing to pay three dollars for that third slice of pizza if the price what you had to pay is four dollars you're not going to buy it now notice that you were you had some extra money laying over uh, from your first and second piece of pizza should you use that to, to make up for that gap on that third piece of pizza no rationally says we should rationality says that we should look at marginal decisions so we should look at what's our um, decision uh, in our decision to buy our third piece of pizza what's the additional benefit what's the additional cost and again, if the benefits don't uh, justify the cost rationally, you shouldn't buy that third piece of pizza. What if prices go up to $6? Right, so this is a little bit trickier, but if prices go up to $6, it's not 16 but $16, then you want to buy that first piece of pizza. How do you feel about that second piece of pizza? Right There we want to use the term indifferent you'd be indifferent towards buying it. The benefits are equal to the costs. It doesn't matter whether you make the decision or not. Eh, go ahead and make it, right? More interestingly, what if the prices went up to $8? Then you clearly don't want to buy that second piece of pizza, but you would want to buy that first piece of pizza. Or alternatively, what if the prices drop all the way down to 50 cents? If prices drop all the way down to 50 cents, then you clearly are going to want to buy one, two, three, four, five slices of pizza. Hey, look at that connection that we just made, right? By tracing out what you're willing to pay and then adjusting the prices, what we found is how many units you'd be willing to buy. That's the connection, right? Remember that demand is the inverse relationship between prices and how many units consumers want to buy it comes from this willingness to pay and what we know about willingness to pay is that consumers tend to have a lower willingness to pay the more units they consume that's the connection that's actually going to be useful for us uh, a couple of um, a couple of topics down the line we're going to come back to that story um, but we wanted to introduce it here we wanted to also make sure that we could tell this story um, in a little bit more formality with an equation, right? So I've got, let's consider a market demand and I've got, oh boy, economic textbooks. There's a clearly a big demand for those, right? I've got this little line right here, right? Would you feel comfortable graphing out this equation? So step one, what should we label our different axes, right? <sighs> right, if you recall, we need to put price on the vertical axis. We need to put quantity on the horizontal axis. Why do we do that? Because that's what uh, Alfred Marshall did, and we still follow his. Um, we still follow his pattern. Every economics textbook that you're looking at, they're putting price on the vertical axis. 
Price goes on the vertical axis. What do we put on the vertical axis? It's always going to be price. Why? Because that's where it goes. Why? Because that's what Alfred, Alfred Marshall said, right? Make sure you've got that drilled into your head that when you're doing these graphs, you need to see price on the vertical axis. All right. Notice um, it's got to be an inverse relationship. So I know it's going to be a downward sloping line. And this is a very, very simple little equation, right? This is a very simple linear equation. And so hopefully you feel pretty familiar with, with how you graph those out. If not, see some of those earlier videos that walk through that. We've got a vertical intercept and we have a downward slope to it. How do I, what do I, where is the vertical intercept? That's the value of 50, right? Again, pause for a second. What does the vertical intercept represent? I've got my equation P equals 50 minus 0.1 Q, QD actually, right? The vertical intercept is the value of the thing we're measuring vertically, in this case P, when the thing we're measuring horizontally, in this case Q, takes on a value of zero. So in my equation, instead of Q, if I put zero and do the math, Verify for yourself, P equals 50. So here we go. What does that vertical intercept represent? It's saying that when P equals 50, Q equals zero. Now stop and think for a second. Could you put what that point represents in words? What does that point represent in everyday language? Right? Think about prices. Prices are the amount that, of money that buyers would pay in a transaction. Q, specifically QD, represents the amount of units that consumers would want to purchase. What we're saying with this vertical intercept of 50 is that if the prices were 50, how many units would consumers want to buy? They wouldn't want to buy any at all, right? That's also true for a price of $70 or $80 or $90 or $100, but, but think about what's special about this price of $50. That's pretty straightforward. Um, think about the horizontal intercept, though. So the horizontal intercept is the other end of this, right? So we know that the vertical intercept, and again, from the equation, all that we see is that the vertical intercept is 50. Very straightforward how we find that, right? How about the slope? Again, we know that the equations we're looking at in this class are almost always going to be a nice little linear equation, and this follows the whole y equals mx plus b format, so it's going to be a straight line, but we also know from this negative 0.1 out in front here that it's going to be a downward sloping line, right? If that's if instead that was plus 0.1, then it would be an upward sloping line, but this is a downward sloping line, so I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and make that a, a very, very straight line with the tool, right? It's a downward sloping line. And again, I just need to draw it as a downward sloping line. I don't have to worry about what I label things as because I don't have any kind of scale on this horizontal. So I don't need to worry about how far out uh, it needs to go. I can just make it a downward sloping line and then I can calculate the value of this point right here. This is what we call our horizontal intercept. And again, the horizontal intercept represents when the thing we're measuring vertically is zero it's the value of the thing we're measuring horizontally. So again, I start out with my basic equation, P equals 50 minus 0.1Q. P equals zero. Plug that into my equation. Now, can I go ahead and solve for Q? This takes a little bit more algebra, right? But let's move the 50 to the left-hand side. So we're subtracting 50 from both sides. So it cancels out on the right-hand side, and I'm left with negative 0.1Q. And let's go ahead and divide through by 0.1, divide through by point, negative 0.1. And on the right-hand side, we've got Q. And on the left-hand side, bring up a calculator just to make sure I don't put the wrong value in here, right? 50 divided by 0.1 equals 500. Q equals 500. So again, let's pull this back together and put it in this format. We solve for the value of Q, but let's think about when P equals, what was the value of P we were using? Zero. QD equals 500. All right, now take that one for a second. Can you put what that value represents in words? Can you, can you put this into your own words? What's going on at that horizontal intercept of 500? 
Again, think about what the P represents for a buyer. Think about what QD represents. Are there times when P equals zero for you as a buyer? Do you have a QD that's not infinity? Think about and, and put into your own words what that, that horizontal intercept would represent. Okay, so we've talked about all the different pieces to this, uh, this equation of the, of the, that describes the demand. I want to point out one thing, and again, this gets back to, to the Alfred Marshall thing, right? Alfred Marshall said, step one, what should we do? We should label P vertically, and we should measure Q horizontally. And that's the convention that we're going to, to adopt. And when we went through this explanation of what those uh, values on the curve represent, and it wasn't just the intercepts, but really we could take any value. Could you real quick calculate um, Q100, what the value of P is? Q100 uh, should be 40 when P equals 40, QD equals 100. Can you put that what that value represents in your own words? And again, think about with the way that we've been explaining what these points represent, which of those variables is the dependent variable and which is the independent variable? Which variable depends on the other variable? Think about the way that we've been explaining what these variables represent and which one represents the dependent variable and which one represents the independent variable. Is that usually the one that we, the one that we think of as the dependent variable? Where do we usually put that? Usually on graphs, that's the thing that we're putting uh, vertically. But is that what Alfred Marshall did? Right? So again, it's a, it's a useful little quirk of the system that he added with putting price on the vertical axis. We're going to go with it. We're going to continue that adoption, like uh, the adoption of his convention, just like every other economic textbook, but realize that this relationship between the dependent and the independent variable, it's a little bit tricky. Okay. Got this great question I want to ask you. What happens to the demand for oranges when the price of oranges increases? What happens to the demand for oranges when the price of oranges increases? More than likely, three possible answers. Number one, you could say that the demand increased. Or you could say the demand decreased. And my hunch is that many of you said the demand decreased, but that would actually be wrong. The third uh, answer is nothing. And that is the correct answer. Back up a second, right? So it has to do with this word right here. This is, again, we're trying to be very, very precise with uh, our terminology. We're trying to be very careful with the way that we use this. Remember, what's demand? I draw it, price, quantity. Demand is this downward sloping line. Demand is this entire line. Demand is the, uh, the, the entire equation that describes that line. What are we considering? We're considering prices going up. If prices were to go up, does that line move? No. What happens to that line when prices go up? Nothing happens to that line. What happens is when prices go up, we move to a different point on that line. When prices go up, you may have said demand goes down, and that would be incorrect. Pr demand doesn't go down. Rather, quantity demanded is what decreases. But if I ask you about the demand, the demand doesn't change, right? So again, a little bit careful. After you're done with this class, you could read the Wall Street Journal and other good sources, and they're going to use the term demand, and they're going to use it a little bit loose, uh, loose, and that's totally fine. But in this class, we're going to try to be really, really careful about the way that we talk about the demand and the way that we talk about the quantity demanded. Prices do not change demand. Other things can shift that demand curve, right? So remember that the demand curve represents buyers wanting to buy a product, right? And so you could think about anything other than price that's going to influence consumer behavior, either pushing consumers towards a market or away from a market. Those are the kinds of things that, that we're going to list under this factors that shift the demand curve, right? So we've got this list of uh, one, two, three, four, five different factors that could shift the demand curve. And we're going to focus on the first two primarily, um, but 
really, uh, this list of five, it doesn't have to end there. Any factor that would push buyers either towards a market or away from a market other than price could fall into this category. Number one, a, a big one in many markets is income, right? Income can drive consumer behavior in a lot of markets, not in all markets, but a lot of the markets. When we talk about the role of income, we have two different ways that are two different terms that we use to talk about the relationship between income and demand. The first one is what we call normal goods, right? So normal goods are goods where there is a direct relationship there's a direct relationship between income and demand. So for example, if I have a normal good, which has this direct relationship between income and demand, for normal goods, when your income goes up, what happens to your demand? It also goes up. So how do I show on the graph on the right an increase in demand? I've got my basic demand, right? Verify again, price vertically, quantity horizontally, demand is a downward sloping line. How do I show an increase in demand? An increase in demand, think of it as a shift to the right. When we talk about an increase in either demand or supply, increases in those curves, you should view them as shifts to the right. So some of you may be looking at this and saying, eh, it doesn't look like it shifted to the right, it looked like it increased like that. That is not correct. Demand did not move up. It did not shift up. Rather, what demand did is demand shifted to the right. We have a demand increase. That's what happens when we have a normal good and your income increases. So what are some examples of some normal goods? Real quick, think about this. What are some goods that you would be more likely to purchase when your income goes up? Right, and again, this is one of those types of questions where I can ask you individually what you're going to do, but really this demand represents what all people in the market is. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you are representative of most consumer uh, behaviors and so think about in general right what are the things that when you have more income you'd want to buy and is it also true that when other people their income went goes up that they would also want to buy these things And as long as those two concepts overlap then your intuition about how you would act individually is going to give you a whole lot of intuition about um, how the whole market would behave right that's a pretty pretty straightforward way to ask the question we could also ask the question going the opposite direction though right normal goods are when there's this direct relationship which just means that those two variables move in the same direction what if instead of having income increase what if instead we had income decrease if it's a direct relationship that means that when income goes down demand is going to go down what would a decrease in demand look like a decrease in demand would look like this shift to the left. So it raises a question. Why do we say that this demand, uh, this increase in demand is a shift to the right and a decrease in demand is a shift to the left? Here we go. What we can do is we can say, yep, let's start out at a given price. At a given price, that's a P for price. I can look at my original demand curve and this was the value of quantity demanded. In green, right, at that price, this was the value of quantity demanded. We say that a shift right is an increase in demand because at a given price, quantity demanded, the amount that people want to buy, has increased. Similarly, we say that a decrease in the demand curve is a shift to the left because at a given price, quantity demanded has fallen, right? It's that impact in quantity demanded. That's why we say that a shift right is an increase in demand or a shift left is a decrease in demand. That whole structure about how demand curves can shift right or left based on whether they increase or decrease, that's going to be true for any of these factors in this list. Uh, finishing out the list of the different factors though, right? We've got, so if income and demand move in the same direction, those are normal goods. Inferior goods are when there is an indirect relationship between those two, uh, those two variables. Indirect relationship means that, right, if your income has gone up, what's happened to your demand? It's gone down, right? Moving in the opposite direction. So again, a way to think about this, what are some things that when you had more income, you would want to buy less of? 
Or alternatively, what if you had less income? What if, what if you knew someone who lost their job? What are the things that they tend to buy more of when they have less income? Those kinds of items are what we call the inferior goods. Next on our list, other goods, specifically other goods that are related to, to our, our product. Those um, can either take the form of substitutes or complements. They can either push buyers towards or away from a market, right? But notice, we don't just talk about substitutes and complements, but we've got this, this, this adjective economic before them, right? We've got economic substitutes or economic complements. What do economic substitutes or economic complements represent? This is a very specific term that we're using in our microeconomics class and it has to do with a relationship but, but I'm going to construct it this way right so it has to do with the the demand for a product let's call that first product good a and the price of its related good good what not y good b so here we go to talk through this, right? We're if we're talking about the demand of good A, I'm going to do strawberries, right? We just got a great amount of strawberries out of our, our, our garden the other day, so my daughter was super, super excited about that. Strawberries. If this is the market for strawberries and there's a downward sloping demand, I just want to make sure everybody's good with this uh, in terms of understanding the different pieces to this, right? Vertically, what are we measuring? This is the price of strawberries. Horizontally, what are we measuring? We're measuring the quantity of strawberries. And what does this represent? This is the demand for strawberries, right? The strawberries are taking the place of good A. What we're thinking about is some other good that's related to strawberries, either as a substitute or a complement. Let's first think about the substitutes. What's a good substitute for strawberries? How about blueberries, right? So this is the strawberry market right here. Somewhere way else, we've got a market for blueberries. And I'm not even gonna bother drawing out the full market for blueberries, but it, because it's somewhere else, it's not on the page. There's something else going on in the blueberry market that has made blueberries become more expensive. Let's consider the price of an increase in blueberries. When blueberries become more expensive, does anything happen to the consumers of strawberries? These two goods are substitutes for each other, right? We can use one or the other. So if this good becomes more expensive, it's going to start pushing buyers into the strawberry market. That pushing buyers into the strawberry market is going to uh, show up as an increase in the demand for strawberries. Again, how do I show an increase in the demand for strawberries? An increase in the demand for strawberries, I take my demand for strawberries and I shift it to the right. Back up, what are the two pieces that we're connecting here, right? So the starting point of our story was that we had an increase in the price of blueberries and it resulted in an increase in the demand for strawberries. With those two variables, an increase in the price of blueberries and an increase in the demand for strawberries, what kind of relationship is that? Economic substitutes are when there is a direct relationship between uh, the price of a related good and the demand for a good. The price of blueberries goes up the demand for strawberries goes up. So more than likely that logic makes total sense, but notice a direct relationship. When you think about two things being substitutes, is the word direct the first term that jumps into your mind? It probably isn't, right? But again, it's this very specific way that we're defining our terminology. When we define economic substitutes, it's not about um, how useful they are, but rather it's about this relationship between the price of one good and the demand for another. That relationship between those two variables is what determines whether or not something is a substitute or whether something's a complement. All right, so a complement is just the opposite. A complement is when there is an indirect relationship between those two. Real quick, think about, do you have a good example for something that is a complement to strawberries? Is there a good complement to strawberries? And if so, think about if you had an increase in the price of that complement. An increase in the price of a complement is going to do what 
to the demand for strawberries. Push it up or push it down. I'm thinking it should push it down, but make sure that that logic is something that makes sense to you. Our last three categories of things, and again, uh, the way to think about this list, these five are the ones that I came up with, but really anything that, uh, that influences consumer behavior, either pushing buyers towards a market or pushing buyers away from a market, that could go on this list. Preferences. What do we mean by preferences? Do you all remember um, when you were growing up from the childhood what the, the hot Christmas item was? Right? I'm pretty old, and so a lot of my examples have nothing to do with uh, with anything you probably know, right? But there's the, um, the, the Furbies or the I don't even know the names, but the, every year I hear what the, the current crop of students have in class, and it always reminds me about how I don't know what the, the kids are, right? Eventually, I'll know when my, when my daughter's old enough to go to college. I'll have a point of reference. In general, right, that's what we're talking about with this category. Something that, other than income or other than the price of related good, but some kind of popularity, some kind of fad, that underlying change in preference that again could either push buyers towards a market or either push them away from a market that's what this category is capturing right so to get back to the strawberries example what if we found out that strawberries actually caused cancer what's going to happen to the demand for strawberries it's going to fall right but that's not a change in income that's not a price and change price in related goods that's about people's underlying value that they place on it based on their preferences for these things right number of buyers what do we mean by number of buyers we mean literally what that name implies and not more than it. We're thinking about the number of people who are showing up in this market to buy stuff. Now remember, right, if we're thinking about strawberries, are you part of the demand for strawberries? You are, even if you're not buying them, right? It may be that your demand for, or your uh, part of this part of the demand curve for strawberries, and it could be that you're part of this part of the demand for strawberries, right? If you really, really, really like strawberries, you're probably got a very high willingness to pay, and you're up there at that that first point, point A in that demand curve, right? But what if you don't? You're not a big fan of strawberries. You don't hate them. You'll buy them, but they're certainly not your first choice of food. You like plums or raspberries or blackberries better, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe you're way the heck down here on this demand curve. That you're not normally in the market unless prices get really, really low for strawberries. You're in the market even if you're not buying it. What we're talking about with this category of number of buyers is an increase in the total number of people who are there to potentially buy something, right? So this is driven a lot by births or deaths or immigration, right? Those kinds of things where we're changing the number of people um, in a demographic group. That can change the demand for something. Expectations. So when we're talking about expectations, two forms. We're thinking about some kind of unknown future value where we're making some kind of assessment on what we think that future value is going to be. Oftentimes we do that with prices, right? So the big thought example that usually resonates is think about what you would do right now today if you knew that for some reason next week the price of gas was going to double. What would you go out and do today? You'd probably go out and fill up your tank right now today, right? that expectation about future prices, even though it hasn't happened, it might change your current behavior today. Or alternatively, when you graduate, hopefully when you graduate, um, you get a job, and some people who graduated just recently, right, in our most recent graduating class, they had a job locked down a few weeks before they graduated, right? Does anything about their consumption change before they graduate, before their income has started to go up? Or later in life, if you think that you're going to get a raise, does that change you to maybe go out and, and change what your consumption is today? Maybe do some debt financing? Or alternatively, what if you expect to lose your job in two months? Might that change the way that you spend money right now today? Again, none of these things have happened, but the, the forward-looking expectations that you put on the way things uh, in the future, that's going to influence your behavior today. All those things matter, but more generally, right? We can think of this list of anything that pushes buyers towards a market or away from a market other than price could fall into this list of factors of demand.